Okay. Okay, so uh, like I was uh, saying that this this is a, a country that was settled by somebody other than the Slavic people. And uh, so we'll get into the history of that right away. And uh, So Hungary is um, in the, and this is a map that supposed to, supposedly dates to about a thousand AD of what Hungary would have looked like at that period of time. And so we have uh, the Poland, uh, Lithuanian uh, Commonwealth area above Hungary. And we have uh, Bohemia to the uh, Northwest and Croatia to the Southwest, and then the Bulgarian Empire, which in a thousand uh, was still uh, a, a semi-power. And, uh, and then to the East, to the Southeast is this uh, Pechenig tribal area. And then the Kevin Rus is to the uh, East of uh, Hungary. So that gets us located where we're, we're talking about. And uh, again, Hungary, hmm. as far as a settled area, uh, archaeologists have, have found artifacts that date back to about 350,000 years uh, ago. And uh, so there's been people in this area for at least that that long a period of time. Uh, the most important early settlers were the Celts and uh, <coughs> they dominated this area up until about the third century BC. And then they, they were probably driven off of the land by other people. So to the, to the east, there were the Thracians, the Dacians and the the Geshans, <coughs> and <coughs> they all left uh, cultural ever. It's basically an area of Transylvania, which is to the south of Hungary. And then the Illyrians were, were the south of them, and, and of course they were in the area that's now Romania. <coughs> By the first century, the Dacian Empire, led by Borobistas, uh, occupied a vast area of the lower Danube. And uh, this was probably the root of uh, Rome's expansion <laughs> into this area. So the two provinces that Rome occupied were Dacia and Pannonia. And Hungary basically contains the area that, that was Pannonia. Um, Augustus and Tiberius brought civilization and an imperial form of government to the two provinces around uh, uh, 400 years before. Uh, so this would have been, you know, we're talking about the at the formation of the Roman Empire, uh, and, and they were in this area until, until 400 AD. And of course, at 400 AD, the, the Roman Empire fell apart because of uh, uh, all sorts of invasions from the Germanic people and whatnot. So the first stone bridge that crossed the Danube actually was uh, erected in 103. And it's, uh, it was in an area which is now where the Danube goes through Romania. I, I thought it was kind of interesting that, uh, you know, they were able to actually figure out that there was a bridge there in 103 AD. Um, there, there are 
there are actually some uh, ruins of Roman uh, civilization in uh, in Budapest. So that, I mean, that shows that it was certainly well occupied and, uh, and civilized back uh, in the zero to 400 AD period of time. So in the fourth century, uh, Rome was in decline. And by 378, the Goths had sacked the Roman uh, army in Andronopolis. Uh, within two decades, the two provinces of uh, uh, Dacia and, and Pannonia uh, became really transit zone for migrating people and, uh, and a war zone for the Turkic uh, and Germanic people and other people. So we're talking about the area we're interested in today was in really in flux as far as who was living in that territory. During the fifth century, the Huns invaded uh, the Balkans uh, and they were also, there's evidence that they also were in, in Hungary and Northern Italy and in parts of France uh, in Gaul. Upon Attila's death in uh, 453, the Huns just seemed to basically disappear. Uh, again, I don't think archaeologists or historians exactly know where the Huns went to after his death, but uh, they were dominant, certainly left. The this author of this book's feeling is uh, that a lot of these people didn't totally leave that, you know, if, if there were Huns there for a period of time, when the Huns left, there were probably a few of them stayed because they, they by that time, they settled in into agricultural life and whatnot. So during the sixth century, the Avars moved into this area and the Avars uh, were probably a Turkish people and they were probably driven into this area because other people were moving into the area around the Black Sea. So what you see in this period of time from about 400 AD up to uh, 1000 is that there was a, a lot of movement of people across the so-called Russian steppes area. And, and they, they were, people were all the time driving other people on to the West. So the Avars uh, gradually were absorbed and, and they became part of the fringe of Charlemagne's uh, Frankish empire. So the Avars would have been on the extreme Eastern side of uh, Charlemagne's domain. And in 567, th there's evidence that the Avars occupied a large part of the Carpathian Basin. So this, you, you, this is the area we're talking about uh, Hungary today. After 620, the Avars started to uh, suffer reoccurring defeats from uh, the Byzantine Empire. And uh, so they were pushed further into this area as, as the Byzantium strengthened and expanded its empire. These people were forced to move from like Romania up into, into the area of Hungary. So the, we had the second collapse of the Avar Empire occurred uh, uh, when Coram uh, Khan's Bulgar warriors uh, and Charlemagne's Frankish troops both uh, converged on the Avars. And uh, that's the second collapse of the Avar. So by 796, uh, the Avars were basically sub were forced to, to uh, submit to the rules of uh, the Frankish empires, and as well as uh, having Moravia, which again was to the northwest, having a strong influence on what happened within the, the land that the Avars were in at that time. So by the second half of the eighth century, the Avars uh, was basically crisscrossed by all sorts of people and uh, there were military marches uh, dividing uh, the lands between the, the Franks, the Moravians, the Bulgars, and what remained of the Avars. 
probably wouldn't have been a very um, friendly area to live in during that period of time because it was uh, it was being contested by a lot of different people. So the Carpathian Plains were neither empty or abandoned, um, but they were soon repopulated by the arriving Magyars. The Avars were definitely not totally wiped out, but they uh, they were basically probably absorbed into the population as other people came into this area and, and just overpopulated. In 894, the Magyars uh, had made a foray as far as uh, the Frankish Empire. Uh, prior to leaving their uh, for their new home in Hungary, the Magyars had uh, allied with the Byzantine Emperor Leo the Philosopher, who was fighting against uh, Tsar Simeon of the Bulgars. So uh, this is it. we're looking at the time right at the beginning of the. Uh, uh, 900s, uh, the Byzantine Empire was having problems with, with the Bulgars trying to push into the, the land that the Byzantine Empire uh, had controlled. I've, I've left a link, link here, so it, this is a about a 49 minute long, uh, well, I think fairly well done story of the Magyar occupation of, of these lands that I, I'll leave that for you to watch uh, when you get this uh, Saturday. In 895, the, the Magyar people living west of the Dnester uh, suffered a, a lightning attack from the Pechenegs and this uprooted them and it uh, drove them to the northwest and they they basically headed into the uh, land of the former Avar kingdom. Uh, there were seven, supposedly seven Magyar tribes that crossed through two passes in the Carpathian Mountains, and they were led by two leaders, Arpad and Kursan. And uh, they also had a, 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 another tribe of people called the Kabars that came along with them in these these were people who were thought to be Turkish uh, origin. <coughs> and so by 900, the settlement of the uh, Carpathian Basin in the Hungarian area was, was considered complete. And in nine, 902, Greater Moravia had, it had, had seen its peak and it was in decline, as we talked about last week when we were talking about the Bohemian uh, kingdom. And Frankish rule was, um, was it, it was also in decline as the last Carolingian uh, monarch, Louis, the infant, uh, exercised only very limited control over any parts of Pannonia. And the Bulgars had, had just suffered a major uh, defeat from the Byzantine Empire, and they were no longer a major threat to come up into this area. It's believed that the Magyar tribes were ruled by two princes. One was a religious leader, the Kendi, and one was a military leader, the Guila. Uh, additionally, legend is that Arpad's father almost was killed at the time that the Pechenegs invaded their lands in, in, uh, in, in the uh, Russian steppes. Now the the history of and, and this narrative that that's on the the link uh, will indicate that they think that the Magyar people uh, came from probably either slightly east or slightly west of the Ural Mountains. They're they're considered to be a, a finno uh people because of the language they speak. By the time they got to uh, Hungary, their, their language, their language was, was kind of a mix of both uh, the Finno-Urgic language and 
some Turkish words thrown in, and they, they said that there are evidences of several Iranian words in the Hungarian language. So uh, they'd been exposed to a lot of other people as they had been forced to migrate and it and picked up other influences in the language that they spoke. So when these tribes came into Hungary, they had basically two major princes and uh, Arpad and, and Kursan and Kursan died in 1904 and that ended the dual princeship and the Arpad dynasty would then rule Hungary for the next 400 years. So we're talking about from a period from nine, 904 up to 1304, basically. During the uh, 900s, the Hungarians engaged in, <laughs> and they, they were very mobile people. They were noted as uh, extremely good horsemen and archers. And they, they basically spent a century raiding the rest of Europe uh, for pillage and, and uh, collecting wealth. And this period was known as the period of adventure because they were all, all the time going out from their, their homeland to other parts of Europe and basically stealing what they could steal. And they, and they got as far as Spain. So they, they, they basically uh, pretty much got all over Europe uh, in their plundering and pillaging and terrorism. In uh, 955, a group of Hungarians uh, led by their tribal leader, Boshu, uh, attempted to raid Augsburg and the, the German kings united to crush uh, this particular raid and uh, they were able to capture Boshu and uh, they executed him on the spot. After the defeat at Augsburg, the, the Hungarians had to acknowledge the supremacy of the Holy Roman Empire. So this is uh, at, at this time, we'll see it, you know, in, in the 970s, they realized that the Holy Roman Empire and, and the Germanic people had the ability to uh, control their own lands. So in 972 to 990. Seven, Giza was the prince of the uh, Magyars, and uh, he uh, rose to the task of establishing some foreign stability between both uh, the Byzantine and the Holy Roman Empires, and he established order within the Hungarian realm. So uh, again, there were like seven tribes so he is, he's the leader of one of the seven tribes at, at this point. And he exerted enough power over everyone that he became their supreme leader. Uh, he, was a he was responsible for the establishment of uh, Christianity in much of Hungary. Uh, there were some other tribal leaders who had accepted East, Eastern Orthodox faith. In fact, the, there's evidence that this had actually even occurred when they were still on the other side of the Carpathians uh, uh, be, because of their contacts with the Byzantine Empire. And there were some church, early churches and monasteries established uh, uh, from the Orthodox Church, uh, especially in the eastern part of Hungary. However, Giza was uh, a very astute observer of uh, what was going on in the world. And he realized that his powerful neighbors to the West uh, were, were Roman Catholics. And uh, more because of politics than anything, he chose to become a Roman Catholic. He was uh, known to require his subject to accept the Catholic faith or face severe treatment. 
supposedly he had the Pechenig uh, tribal chief who again had come along with the whole group into uh, Hungary. He had him buried alive for refusing to accept uh, uh, conversion to Christianity. So G Giza wasn't, he wasn't a very nice guy. He, uh, he, he died in 997 and prior to his death, he, he made arrangements for his son, uh, Vok, who was uh, born in 970 to be married and, and who was married to Gazella, who was the daughter of Henry of Bavaria. Um, uh, Giza recognized that there, there'd be a major obstacle of having his son uh, succeed as, as the major prince of uh, the Magyars. So he made sure that he had uh, a group that were known as the Black Hungarians, and they, they were comprised of the uh, Zecklers, the Pechenegs, and other uh, Turkish uh, settlers who'd come along with the Magyars. He, he had them basically go and surround uh, the major rival for the, the princeship, uh, whose name was Kopany, he, he, and he had a large uh, ducal property holding, and he had these so-called Black Hungarians just go surround his uh, property. And after he died, his son, Falk, who would later be uh, Estevan or uh, St. Stephen had to battle this guy and his uncle, Gaiula, for three years to become the king of Hungary. So in a, a devastating defeat, uh, Stephen was finally able to uh, mortally wound uh, Kopany, and he had him drawn and quartered, and he sent a uh, body quartered to each corner of the realm so people would understand that he was uh, now in control of Hungary. In one of the quarters he sent to his uncle, Gaiola. Um, Can I just ask a question? Yeah. The, the one that you mentioned just before, who was buried alive, did, the, did he get him out and this was a form of punishment? Or did no, he, he buried him alive. And no. So he never a, came out. He never came out. That was a way to get rid of somebody who wouldn't convert. Oh dear. So, so uh, Stephen, Stephen had continuing problems with other princes. Like I said, you had seven tribes. We're still into a, a group of people that are, are, you know, still haven't moved away from tribalism totally. Um, and so he had another one, uh, uh, on, and he was the prince of the, he was actually the prince of the Eastern Black Hungarians. And uh, Stephen tolerated him till 1028. And then 1028, he had a battle with him and he managed to kill him and consolidate power in Hungary. And, and pretty much at that point in time, it ended tribalism. Um, St. Stephen ruled for 40 years. He had a really long rule for, this, for somebody that was. Uh, living back in the 1000 period of time. Um, and he was, he was actually a, a fairly devout Christian and he basically completed the uh, conversion of the rest of the Magyars to Christianity. And uh, during his reign, the government kind of came into existence uh, he defined 40 counties with a, a governor appointed to each county, and the governor was in charge of the people and the military within a county. The counties didn't constitute all land, so it wasn't like you laid out a map and then you know divided it all up into 40 counties, and that, that was everything within the border. The 40, 40 counties did not constitute all land. Some land belonged to, to the, the nobles or, or the old tribal leaders, and some land by then also was, had been given to the church. The king at that time was responsible for the government of the state. And uh, he was really responsible for the establishment and, and care of the church. 
and uh, he was also responsible for regulations, rights, and duties of property owners. The state St. Stephen uh, died in 1038. Uh, after his death, there would be 22 more kings would follow him uh, who were members of the House of Arpad. And uh, after his death, there, there were a series of succession crises. Uh, uh, again, there, it wasn't clearly established whether the uh, surviving brother or the son would become the king. So there were, were some crises in, in uh, um, succession, and, and these were basically uh, uh, sorted out in and the succession was restored by Laszlo, uh, who was uh, king from 1077 to 1095. So in the period of 1077 to 1116, uh, you, you, we see an advance in uh, justice and culture in Hungary. Uh, and during this period of time, the Magyar people and, and the Hungarians uh, expanded their territorial reach into the Balkans, uh, into Croatia and Dalmatia. So they're moving uh, to the uh, south and uh, getting back to the Adriatic Sea area. So in uh, 1172 to 1196, Bela III becomes a uh, King of Hungary, and he strengthens the power of the state. And he also uh, strengthened the power of the uh, lay nobles that, that own land. The oldest known Hungarian text uh, was created somewhere between 1192 and 1195, and it's a thing called the Prey Codex. And I assume it's exactly what it says. It's a, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a, collection of prayers. In uh, 1222, uh, Anders was the uh, king, and uh, he basically was kind of forced to give a golden bull that full, that characterized the equal rights of, of the nobles. So again, this is uh, it's in about the same period of time where this kind of thing was happening pretty much all over Europe. So in 1241, uh, the Mongols invaded Hungary. Uh, king Bela IV was king then, and he, he fled to uh, uh, Dalmatia to avoid the, the Mongols. And uh, the, they didn't come that far west or south. <laughs> uh, while he was in exile, the Horde's leader, Ogaday, uh dies, and the, 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 a matter of history, uh, it's not really clear why when he dies, the, all these invaders just left. They, they all went back to, uh, I guess, to Mongolia. So when they retreated, Bella the fourth returns to rebuild Hungary. And the, the Mongols basically, they basically destroyed anything that was standing in Hungary. So he had a major, major uh, task of rebuilding. And one of the one of the, his projects was the construction of Buda Castle. Uh, and uh, he helped establish. Buddha as a major trading center. And, and as the book says, the devastation was so complete that he actually had to replat the you know towns and whatnot that uh, they had just destroyed everything. And uh, so he had to replat the towns and relay out the counties. Um, so we get up to 1301 and the House of Arpad at this point has no uh, further male heirs, they, they'd gone for a couple of uh, heirs in a row before this 
happened. Uh, two previous to 1301, and it, 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 they, they don't say a lot in the history that I read why, but he uh, refused to uh, have relations with with the wife who, who he'd been basically set up with, who was, I think she was, uh, she was from one of the Italian states. And uh, he, he, I think he had some illegitimate children, but he had no legitimate heirs. And he, he basically just didn't seem to have any uh, uh, sense of need to perpetuate his family's rule. And uh, because he had no children, one of his brothers or uncles ended up as the king when he passed, and he had no children either. So that was the end of the House of Arpad after 400 years. So at that point in time, we have uh, two Angevin kings, Charles Robert and uh, Louis the First, the Great. And uh, this was a period of uh, progress and expansion. Uh, Louis I actually, along with being the king of Hungary, also becomes the king of Poland in 1370. In 1367, uh, the University of Peck was, uh, was founded. So this is the Again, this is the oldest uh, university in Hungary. Uh, in 1387 to 1417, Sigmundson of Luxembourg, and we heard about him last week also. He's the future uh, Holy Roman Empire, and he engaged in uh, half a century worth of struggle with the barons. And uh, he was the one that was responsible for withdrawing from the Balkans and Dalmatia. So he, uh, he basically got hungry out of those areas. And in 1416 to 1456, the Ottoman Empire is uh, continuously threatening to uh, take over Hungary, invade and take over Hungary. In uh, 1456, uh, Jonas... Uh, Anyadi, uh, who was a military leader and governor, and he was a great commander, he stopped the Ottoman expansion at uh, Belgrade. In uh, 1458 to 1498, Matthias I, who was uh, Anyadi's son, reconstructed the uh, Hungarian uh, kingdom and introduced uh, some uh, Renaissance culture to Hungary. In uh, 1514, a peasant revolt occurred uh, under Georgi uh, Doza and uh, Isvan Urbaki Z uh, laid out a corpus of civil law that established its uh, customary right of nobility to the debt of the peasants. And at this particular uh, corpus of civil law basically reduced uh, the peasants to uh, essentially to total servitude, and as, as I pointed out, essentially to slavery. Uh, this particular co corpus basically said that uh, the peasants uh, had to stay on the land. They were property of the, of the uh, noble and, uh, and they couldn't leave without his permission. So they were they were basically bound to the land. They had to, they had to work so many uh, days a year uh, for him. And uh, there really wasn't anything that provided them with any uh, uh, guarantee for part of the crop they raised or part of the cattle that they took care of. It just basically was a, a set of laws that gave the nobles all the rights. In 1526, uh, Suleiman the First, the Magnificent, attacked uh, the Hungarians at uh, Mohawks and he annihilated the Hungarian army. army. So at this time, uh, two kings divided Hungary up. Ferdinand the First uh, 
of the Habsburg Empire, who we talked about last week also. And Janos uh, Sapolyai uh, split up Hungary and uh, the Sultan occupied uh, Buda and the Ottomans occupied the middle of Hungary. And the Hungary was basically split into three parts. Uh, the Western part was uh, part of the Habsburg Empire. And then Transylvania and the area where the Ottomans uh, settled. Uh, and this division would last to the end of the 17th century. Uh, Transylvania under the Ottoman rule became a semi-independent principality. Uh, in 1568, Transylvania Diet actually proclaimed religious freedom for the people that lived in uh, uh, Transylvania. In 1571, Stephen Bathory uh, is elected a prince of uh, Transylvania, and he later would become the king of Poland. And, uh, so in 1604 to 1606, <clears throat> we have, a, have one of the first uprisings against the Habsburgs led by this found Rosaki. So from 1613 to 1629 was considered to be the golden age of Transylvania. And there was another war against the Habsburgs occurred during this period of time. So from 1657 to 1705, Leo I was the king of Hungary. He was also the Holy Roman Emperor. And he introduced uh, Habsburg absolutism to uh, Hungary, to the part that he controlled. So in 1686, uh, we have the liberation of uh, Buddha from the Ottomans. And uh, 1687, uh, Transylvania really falls under the uh, influence of Vienna and becomes part of the Austrian Empire. In 1699, there's a peace treaty with the Ottoman Empire, and it ends 138 years of occupation. So we're seeing now, and by 1700, the Ottoman Empire is starting to go into its uh, long uh, and eventual collapse. From 1701 to 1703, there was a war of liberation from, from the Habsburgs. It was led by Fernick, uh Rakaki, and uh, again, it didn't uh, accomplish much. Uh, from 1722 to 1723, the uh, Hungarian Diet uh, sanctioned the succession of a female Habsburg line, and uh, as part of this diet, they, they had nobility uh, retain their privileges, uh, especially as it relates to uh, their treatment of their of their serfs and peasants. So, in uh, 1740 to 1780, we have the enlightened and conciliatory reign of uh, Maria Theresa of Austria. Uh, and in uh, 1789 to 1790, her son Joseph. Uh, was uh, an enlightened absolutist, and he tried unsuccessfully to implement reforms. Uh, his reform, really the reforms he wanted to implement was he wanted to, he wanted to basically free the serfs and the nobility. Uh, did everything in their power to uh, thwart his reforms. So in uh, 1848 and 49, we have the revolution that passed. Uh, it was basically a war of independence uh, fought against the uh, Habsburgs. And uh, so King Ferdinand V uh, sanctioned the uh, April laws of constitutional uh, transformation and, and the abolition of serfdom. So we finally see an end to serfdom in uh, 1849, and the Hungarian government uh, is basically established at past. Uh, thank you so, thank you so much. Bye. Mm -hmm. So uh, 
there's a war of liberation from August of uh, September to from September of 19, 1848 to August of 1849. And during this period of time, uh, Ferdinand abdicates uh, his uh, crown. And so a young France Joseph uh, is enthroned in December of uh, 1848. During this time, Kasuth becomes a president governor of Hungary. Um, so Francis Joseph invites Tsar Nicholas to invade Hungary. And uh, Hungary basically lays down their arms. The, the Hungarian army lays down their arms at uh, Miklagos uh, in Kasuth goes into exile. Uh, so we have a period following this of executions and repression. And uh, as, as they say in the, in the book, this is a period of neo-absolutism, neo new, new absolutism. Uh, so you get into passive resistance uh, and then uh, the Habsburgs start uh, to reconcile with the people of Hungary. In 1865, uh, Fernick uh, Deke starts to talk with Vienna about the uh, restoration of constitutional freedoms. In 1867, there's a compromise based on mutual concession. And this, this is the start of 51 years of uh, Austro-Hungarian dualism. So it, this is at the point where the Habsburg family has recognized that the only way that they're going to keep their empire together is to allow Hungary to be really a, a separate entity uh, from Austria, but under the rule of the uh, Austrian emperor. In uh, 1873, Buddha and Pest and Old Buddha uh, unite to be, form one city. So Budapest as a city is uh, was basically formed in 1873. In uh, 1908, Bos Bosnia-Herzegovina was uh, annexed by the Austro-Hungarian monarchy. And uh, in 1910, the uh, census, this is the uh, last census before First World War, uh, indicated there were 18,146,000 Hungarians, of which 54.5% uh, spoke Hungarian as their native language. And at this point in time, there had been a million and a half Hungarians had immigrated to the U.S., this was in 1910. In uh, 1912, there were uh, general labor strikes in, uh, in Hungary. In 1914, we have uh, the assassination of the crown prince and his wife in Sarajevo and World War I results. So in 1916, France Joseph, uh, who really is kind of the last uh, Austro-Hungarian emperor uh, dies uh, in 1918. Hungary's defeated and it, it ends the uh, Austro-Hungarian empire. Uh, and Michael Paroli becomes the president of the Republic of Hungary. So he, he was uh, president for uh, Short period of time in 1919, Bela uh regime collapsed, and uh, Admiral Miklos Horthy and, and and the National Army enter the capital, and they basically take over. Mm -hmm. uh, so in 1920, Horthy's are elected as a reagent <laughs> regent of the kingdom, and the treaty treaty of. Uh, Trion, which is again part of the negotiations that were taking place after the end of the First World War, uh, sees Hungary lose uh, about two thirds of its territory. 
and uh, it lost about 10 and a half million people. Uh, three, thousand, three million of those being Maggiers. Uh, so these are people that lived in parts of the old Hungarian uh, estate that uh, once it was split up after this treaty uh, were no longer Hungarians. From uh, 1921 to 31, uh, Count Isvan Bethlen was is the president of the Council of Ministries, and uh, he he consolidates uh, his power in the government and uh, come really develops a revisionist foreign policy. Uh, in 1927, they enacted a new monetary policy, and they replaced the old crown with the pingo and. Uh, it took 12,500 crowns to make one pingo. So I think it's obvious that, that uh, and, and of course this was going on in all of the part of Europe that had been part of the uh, uh, German, uh, Austrian empire that was really involved in hyperinflation at that time. So this, this is not only a phenomenon that happened in Hungary, but it also happened in Germany. So in, by 1931, the whole, whole world was in uh, worldwide depression and uh, Bethlehem leaves the government. Uh, so from 32 to 36, the government was led by Yoyola Combos, and uh, he he turns the, the political approach to the right, and uh, has a reproachment with Hitler. Um, <coughs> in 1938, the Polish government enacts their first anti-Semitic law, and also in 1938, Hitler. Uh, um, it is involved in arbitration in Vienna, which restores uh, <coughs> Slovakia to Hungary. <coughs> well, let's take our uh, 10 minute break here and uh, we'll get back at it after the break. Um, all of these um, Eastern European countries and European countries spoke languages that were derived from Indo-European, didn't they? Uh, including the Russians. Um, well, um, yes and, and no. Hungary is kind of the exception because this is a, a finno yurgic uh, language, so it, it it's different from all the rest of these countries because the, the others were Indo-European languages, but Hungarian was not. I think it's still Indo-European. It's just a different school, and it's actually related to Finnish. Yes, that's right. It's just more distant from the other, uh, either the Slavic or the Germanic languages. So it, it's not really, it's not similar to the other. Right. Okay, well, we're, uh, we're headed back uh, to the uh, beginning of the, of the uh, Second World War now. Uh, in 1939, Hungary occupies the Carpathian part of the Ukraine. Uh, and they enact their second anti-Semitic law. And you see the rise of the uh, Hungarian Nazi party, which was called the Arrow Cross. In 1940, the uh, second arbitration occurs in Vienna and Transylvania is returned back to Hungary. Um, in 1941, Hungary attacks Yugoslavia. Hungary also uh, enters the war against Russia. And the prime minister of uh, of Hungary commits suicide because of uh, his, I think his, uh, you know, his feeling of impending doom 
by what's going on. In uh, 1942 to 44, Miklos uh, Kale was appointed the head of the government. And he actually uh, tried to make uh, uh, a few approaches to the, uh, to the allies uh, to try to find a way that Hungary could get out of the war. Uh, he, he knew that they were, you know, that they, they were more or less committed because of politics to the, to the Nazis, but he, he didn't want to see his country absolutely destroyed uh, because of the war. In uh, 1943, the Hungarian Second Army was annihilated at uh, Voronezh on the Don River. Um, and uh, again, uh, Calais was tried to have some secret negotiations with the British on trying to end the war. In 1944, uh, the German army actually occupied Hungary in March, and they appointed a pro-German government at that point in time. In uh, 1944, uh, Jewish deportment to death camps uh, occurred for 437,000 people. And the Soviet army uh, in 1944 started to cross into Eastern Hungary to, to uh, liberate Hungary from the Germans. In 1944, uh, October 15th, Admiral Orthy proclaimed an armistice. Uh, uh, Germany was still strategically occupying parts of uh, Hungary. And uh, at this point, Horthy ap appoints a Nazi, uh, Pernik uh, Salsi, uh, as the president of the Council of Ministers. Um, Horthy's position, as I, as I re recall reading at this point in time, is he was, the, uh, he was basically the uh, head of government in Austria at this point in time. In 1944, there was a bloody terror uh, conducted by the Arrow Cross. Again, this was the Hungarian Nazis, and they uh, basically basically either murdered or or uh, sent 105,000 uh, Jewish people from Budapest to uh, uh, death camps. In 1944, uh, December. Uh, 22nd, 1944, the National Assembly uh, and a provisional government was established, and it had three communist ministers. So we're coming, coming up now to the end of the war. In 1945, the uh, Soviet army liberates uh, Budapest on April 4th, and uh, they have a, le a legislative election on November 4th. And the smallholders party draws 57% of the vote. The communists draw 17%. And a, a coalition government is uh, formed, and it includes uh, four communist ministers. In 1948, there's a proclamation of a new republic. And again, monetary reform was uh, enacted in a new currency called the Forint replaced the uh, Pingo, and it took 400,000 quadrillion Pingos to make one foreign. So I, as you can see, at the end of uh, World War II, Hungary's money was absolutely worthless. So at, at this point in time, uh, Zoltan Tildy was uh, uh, the president of Hungary. 1947 started a three-year plan of reconstruction and the Soviet army stayed in Hungary. And they basically took over the government during this period of time. So in 1949, uh, Cardinal Masendi and uh, several other Catholic church leaders were put on uh, uh, trial and, and sent to prison. Oops. 1950, the uh, Communist Party uh, 
basically established a dictatorship in, in uh, Hungary. So Stalin dies in 1953. In 1956, there was a mass demonstration and uprising in Budapest. In Hungary, actually withdrew from the Warsaw Pact. Uh, this did not go over well with the uh, Soviets, and so the, they invaded Budapest. During this period of time, 200,000 people managed to flee the country. And in 1956, Joseph Kadar took over <coughs> the government as the uh, general secretary of the Communist Party. From 57 to 65, uh, you basically had a period of mass repression. There were over 300 political executions of people who were involved in the uprising in 1956. In 61, uh, agriculture was recollectivized. In 1963, the uh, communist government enacted a, a general amnesty <coughs> for all the political prisoners that had been taken during the <coughs> repression from the 1956 revolt. So in 1968, the communist government started to uh, enact some economic reforms. <coughs> they were trying to get the economy to, to take off and, and provide better uh, standard of living for the people. But uh, four years later, the economic reforms had come to an impasse and uh, they certainly weren't enough. So in 1985, Qadar's uh, government had uh, finally run out of steam. He, he'd been in, uh, in power for 19 years at this point in time. And Hungary was heavily in, in debt uh, to foreign uh, countries. So in 1988, Qadar was finally sacked as the uh, general secretary of the party. And he'd been in power at that time uh, for 32 years. And this was the foundation for uh, literally for political parties to be established. So in 89, uh, the crisis of government deepens, uh, and they actually conducted a national funeral for Emory Nagy and the 300 uh, of the political uh, victims of the, the repression after 1956. Uh, and there were, they, there were roundtable discussions held on forming uh, a democratic government in 1989. So on October 2030, 1989, Hungary uh, proclaimed a, a new republic. And in 1990, the elections were held. In 1999, uh, Hungary joins NATO. And in uh, 2004, Hungary joined the European Union. I guess, I, I don't know whether it's uh, a black eye or just a, a statement of fact, but uh, in 2010, uh, Viktor Orban was elected prime minister. He's still prime minister. So that's 22 years that he's been in office. He was actually first elected as uh, prime minister uh, as early as 1998. So that's uh, pretty much the history of Hungary and, and where it's at. Uh, And now we're going to watch a little uh, history of Budapest. We, did, uh, we did one of uh, uh, Prague last week, so I thought this would be a, a good way to end up today. Hey guys, what's 
to Bangalore, China, and welcome to Budapest, Hungary. Budapest, Hungary's capital, is uh, bisected by the river Danube. Its 19th century chain bridge connects the hilly Buda district with flat pest. A funicular runs up Castle Hill to Buddha's old town, where the Budapest History Museum traces city life from Roman times onward. Trinity Square is home to 13th century Matthias Church and the turrets of the Fisherman's Bastion, which offers sweeping views. Budapest is the most populous city of Hungary and the ninth largest city in the European Union by population within city limits. This The city has an estimated population of 1,752,286 over a land area of about 525 square kilometers. Budapest is both a city and county and forms the center of the Budapest metropolitan area, which has an area of 7,626 square kilometers and a population of 3,303,786, comprising 33% of the population of Hungary. The history of Budapest began when an early Celtic settlement transformed into a Roman town of Akinkum, the capital of Lower Pannonia. The Hungarians arrived in the territory in the late 9th century, but the area was delayed by the Mongols in 1241-42. To reestablish, the Buddha became one of the centers of Renaissance humanist culture by the 15th century. The Battle of Mohawks in 1526 was followed by nearly 150 years of Ottoman rule. After the reconquest of Buddha in 1686, the region entered a new age of prosperity, with Pest Buddha becoming a global city after the unification of Buddha, of Buddha and Pest on 17 November 1873, with the name Budapest given to the new capital. Budapest also became the co-capital of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, a great power that dissolved in 1918 following World War I. The city was uh, the focal point of the Hungarian Revolution of 1848, the Battle of Budapest in 1945, and the Hungarian Revolution of 1956. Budapest is a beta plus global city with strengths in commerce, finance, media, art, fashion, research, technology, education, and entertainment. It is Hungary's financial center and was ranked as the second fastest developing urban economy in Europe. Budapest is the headquarters of the European Institute of Innovation and Technology, the European Police College, and the first foreign office of the China Investment Promotion Agency. Over 40 colleges and universities are located in Budapest, <laughs> including the Iokos Loran University, the Corvinus University, the Semmelweis University, at the Budapest University of Technology and Economics. Open in 1896, the city's subway system, the Budapest Metro serves 1.27 million, while the Budapest Tram Network serves 1.08 million passengers daily. The uh, central area of Budapest along the New River is classified as a UNESCO World Heritage Site and has several notable monuments of classical architecture, including the Hungarian parliament and the Buddha castle. The city also has around 80 geothermal springs, the largest thermal water cave system, second largest synagogue, and third largest parliament building in the world. Budapest attracts around 12 million international tourists per year, making it a highly popular destination in Europe. The city was chosen as the best European destination of 2019, a major poll conducted by EBT, 
a tourism organization partnering with the European Commission. It also topped the best European destinations 2020 list by Big Seven Media. Budapest also ranks as the third best European city in a similar poll conducted by WIPS. Budapest, strategically placed at the center of the Carpathian Basin, lies on an ancient route linking the hills of Transdanubia with the Great Lake. By road, it is 216 kilometers southeast of Vienna, 545 kilometers south of Warsaw, 1,565 kilometers southwest of Moscow, 1,122 kilometers north of Athens, 788 kilometers northeast of Milan, and 443 kilometers southeast of Prague. The 525 square kilometers area of Budapest lies in central Hungary, surrounded by settlements of the agglomeration in Pest County. The capital extends 25 and 29 kilometers in the north-south, east-west direction, respectively. The Danube enters the city from the north. Later, it encircles two islands, Buda Island and Margaret Island. The third island, Sepel Island, is the largest of the Budapest Danube Islands. However, only its northernmost tip is within city limits. The river that separates the two parts of the city is 230 meters wide and its narrowest point in Budapest. Best lies on the flat terrain of the Great Plain, while Buda is rather hilly. The white Danube was always fordable at this point because of a small number of islands in the middle of the river. The city has marked topographical contrasts. Buda is built on the higher river terraces and hills of the western side, while the considerably larger Pest spreads out on a flat and featureless sand plain on the river's opposite bank. Pest's terrain rises with a slight eastward gradient, so the easternmost parts of the city lie at the same altitude as Buda's smallest hills, notably Gillard Hill and Castle Hill. The Buddha hills consist mainly of limestone and dolomite, the water created speleothems, the most famous ones being the Palpolji cave and the Zimlohekji cave. The hills were formed in the Triassic period. The highest point of the hills and Budapest is Chanos Hill at 527 meters above sea level. The lowest point is the line of the Danube, which is 96 meters above sea level. Budapest is also rich in green areas. Of the 525 square kilometers occupied by the city, 83 square kilometers is green area, park, and forest. The uh, forests of Buda Hills are environmentally protected. Hey, Jim, we seem to have lost the audio.
Okay, well, that's, uh, that's the conclusion of our uh, tour through Hungary. Um, any, any comments, questions? It's beautiful. It's hillier than I thought it would be. It's beautiful. I was impressed by the fact that you don't see lots of high rise glass buildings. Yes. In Budapest. Yeah, it's refreshing. <laughs> it really is. So who can tell me what the two parts of Budapest are? The two neighborhoods in Budapest, what are they called? Buda, Pest, and Old Buda. I think it's just Buda and Pest. I hadn't heard about the third, but. Yeah, that's Old that, Buddha simply means again. Old Buddha. That's Old, that's old Buddha. Right. I, I they have a park in Budapest of monuments of communist figures that have been taken down and moved into a park. I wanted to go see that when I was there, but I wasn't able to get there in the tour we were on. But. I, th I think there's, I, I've seen, I've actually seen a, uh, I think Rick Steves did a, a, a bit on that in one of his travel log. Mm -hmm. A couple other places where they've done the same thing, where they collected all the old communist uh, statuary and moved them into a, their own park. Jim, why were they so against the Jewish people in the well, history? They, they they actually weren't uh, horribly against them up until Hitler got involved in, in the Second World War. Okay, and, and, I, and I think it's the same, you know, it's the same, same kind of problem that, that exists all over uh, the world. And, and, and you know, the, the one, the one factual matter is, is for, for all of history, the Jewish people have valued education. And so they have always been an educated population. And in many places, they were the only really uh, literate people in, in those countries. So, you know, a lot of people held that against them because they, they were smart, they were educated. And, and, and like I said, the reason that they were in most parts of Europe is because the Catholic Church was against usury and the Jewish population was used to, to provide banking service to be able to borrow money. Okay. Thank and, you. And I think that's why, why a lot of, uh, you know, why the, a lot of the negative sentiment comes up over time is it, it has to do with the, the use of money. Okay. It's not something, it's the root of all evil. It really is. <laughs> well, yeah. Thank I you. think there's some evil with other roots too, maybe. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> well, like I said, the, the, the thing that's really kind of unique about Hungary is, is uh, that it, its population origin is, is really quite different than pretty much the rest of Eastern Europe. I mean, this, is, this was a different migration of people. Twice now. 
we had a delegation from Hungary visit Marietta College and they came to our two leadership classes. I taught one of the classes and I had them come to my home for dinner. And um, I was very impressed with them. They were intelligent and polite and I enjoyed having them. But they re there was one student from Romania and she talked about going through Transylvania to get to Hungary. Yeah. But it sounded as if in this that Transylvania was part of Hungary, but I didn't think it was. Well, well it was. Uh, Transylvania has, <laughs> it's, it's kind of been a ping pong ball between uh, countries and it, it has moved back and forth between Romania and uh, Hungary several times over history. And uh, so, so at that time then they, they were not a part of Hungary, I guess. Well, like like I said, there was there was a a fairly long period of time when the Ottoman Empire controlled that area that that uh, Transylvania was was uh, an independent country by itself. You know, well, they since, had their own world, since World War II, Transylvania has been part of Romania, and uh, since, after, the population since after is still II. largely Hungarian speaking. So it's. Yeah. Uh, Hungary, Hungary lost a lot of, of territory. There are a lot of Hungarian ethnically people who are not within the country of Hungary. So that's, but yeah. that's uh, I think there are Hungarians also in Slovakia and some that, of the that's other correct. countries that border, border Hungary. Hungary. Well, next, next week, we will move on to uh, Romania and Bulgaria. And I hope everybody has an enjoyable weekend and uh, get outside and enjoy the nice weather this afternoon. Thank you. You and Thank you. Thank you. So interesting. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jim. Thank you.